Yeah, call John Paul. Microphone moving. 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 How about now? Still low? Here, let's turn up. Let's turn up this button right there. All right. Should be all right. Better? Better? All right. John Paul, where's John Paul at? Son, you all right? To, can you turn off that air conditioning back here? I'm going to get 90, 90 degrees in here. Let's hang in there. All right, John Paul. Now, now we can start. How you doing, JP? Yeah, well, kick back, relax, and and try to try to listen to the Bible study, I guess. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, um, let's see. Let me turn this off. At least on to low. I think we're finally, finally ready. All right. Well, I was uh, really quiet now. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like. Too quiet now. Let me. Let me. I, I should be all right. I could. I could. I could focus on. Uh, I could focus with, with the fan speed at two. Well, anyway, I was reflecting on our, our door knocking from Sunday, and I asked the Lord, you know, what do what do I preach tonight? And I was walking around my house and talking with the Lord, sitting down and getting up and going to the garden, pulling some weeds, going back to my office, pulling books out of the shelf, opening up and looking for some type of inspiration, skimming through some some uh, some books and things. And finally, I got up out of my chair. I made me a, a microwave s'more uh, after my weeks-long vegetarian diet and got me a microwave s'more, and next thing you know, it was bang. The Lord laid a, a passage on my heart, like, quick. I mean, it was like, you know, I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, here it is. I'm going to go back, and he's going to have me preach on some dietary message or something like that. And, and uh, no, he was gracious. He, he was gracious with me. And uh, Revelation 3 came to, came to my mind. Revelation chapter 3. Starting at verse number 7. Revelation 3, we'll read verse 7 and 8. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Now come to verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And look at verse number uh, 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So if I had a title for this evening's message, it would be Doors Opening and Doors Closing. So in one church... The Church of Philadelphia, God says this. He says, I open and no man shuts, and I shut and no man openeth. That's what he says. Behold, I have set before thee an open door that no man can shut. And in the very next church, it's the opposite picture. Jesus is outside of the door and won't open the door, and he leaves it up to man to open the door. That just amazes me. That, that marvels me that there are two different pictures of the Lord right there. There's a stark contrast among those, among those two passages there. One, in one passage, God looks so mighty. He looks so high. He looks so powerful. I, I shut and no man opens. And, and, you know, I, and I open and no man shut in this door. And in the very next church, he appears to be so, so human. I don't, I don't want to use the word helpless, but he's standing outside of the door. He's, he's knocking, standing there, and they won't let him in. Now, that's, that's something to think about. That's something to think about. Now, which church are you and which Christian are you? Now, that's it. That's the message. That's the message that I got. And you just heard it. Now you gotta, you got to chew on it with me for as I've been chewing on it for two days now. So we're going we're gonna to try to digest this uh, together. 
And in one church, God says, I, I can do this, and nobody can do anything about it. And then in the very next church, he's standing there outside. They put him out. He can't get in. And it's in the hands of, of man to let him in. Isn't that, just, isn't that strange to think of how polar opposite that that is? It's a sad thing what the Laodicean church did, putting him outside. And one of those uh, communist Chinese, one of those great Christians, there's been a lot of good Christians from communist China that, that come out of China because China's a great persecuted nation. They persecute Christians. There's a couple of them I was looking up. Wang McDowell, Alan Yuan, Watchman Nee. Go look them up. They got great, great inspirational stories and stuff. And there was a Christian who got released from prison in China, and he was able to make a trip over to America. And when he got back, they all wanted to know, what are, what are the churches like in America? What are they like? They all wanted to hear, what are these churches like over in America? And the only thing that he could tell them was that he was amazed with all they can do without God. And he was amazed that, look how much they have done without God. And that's quite the thought, doing all these great, wonderful, big things and wonderful works and, you know, bearing the name of Jesus. And yet they've done it without God. They've done it all in man's power. That's, a, that's, that's quite the statement to make. Now, I don't have a particular outline for tonight. I just have just a simple thought that the Lord laid on my heart. And in one church, God set before man an open door, okay, that no man can close. And in the very next church, man set before God a door that God can't open, that not even God himself will, will open this, this door. And the only thing that I could figure out with, with that is that uh, one church was weak, in the other church thought they were strong. And you notice in the church of Philadelphia uh, that they did not get in trouble. Look at verse number 8. Look at verse 8 real quick. He says, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength. Do you see that? Thou hast a little strength. Out of, out of all the things you, you could say was wrong with the church of Philadelphia is they had a little strength. If you could even say that that's wrong. I don't even believe that that's... He's rebuking them for that. I don't believe that at all. So the church of Philadelphia, and there's seven churches mentioned in the book of Revelation. Two of them we can find that have no rebuke. One's the church of Philadelphia, and the other one is the church of uh, Smyrna. Look, that's in, that's in chapter 2, verse number 8. You, you can read that real quick. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. How about that? This church has tribulation and poverty, but God calls them rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. And you go on and read it. There's no rebuke to the church of Smyrna. You could say maybe there were people in the church of Smyrna saying that there are Jews, or that's just some outside people. You know, it seemed like the church of Smyrna, church of Philadelphia, they got nothing from the Lord but encouragement, exhortation, and things like that. So God says this, I know that you, you got a little strength, so in other words, they're operating in, in weakness. That's how they're, that's how they're moving. And, and, the, and God said, since you have little strength, I'll open a door for you, and I'm going to hold it open for you. That's like a, that's like a gentleman. I, I, I like that. Little strength, the little strength. I can't even open this door. I'm going to open it for you. And, uh, and then, look, then we get over in verse number 17 into the Laodicean church. Look at verse number 17. Because... Thou sayest, I am. Underline that. How much farther do we have to go? Do we, 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 we even got to read the rest of them? Isn't I am one of God's titles? He's the I am that I am. That's one of his titles. And when you steal God's glory and go on living for, your, for yourself and your own strength, that's the American church today. And you could read them. I am rich. I am increased with goods. I am in need of nothing. And the church that don't need anything from God will not get anything from God. It's that simple. And it, it was the church that was weak. And, I, and, and stop there and think about that. The church that was weak. It, it's the Christian that is weak that God gives. Uh, uh, he just overloads them with power. You know, the Apostle Paul is, is, a, is a clear example. You know, when I'm weak, Christ is, is strong. And uh, then there's the Christian who sticks their head up so high and puffs up their chest so much and says, you know, and says pretty much, I am. Well, Jesus is outside. He's standing out. You ain't letting him do nothing. You, you can't do nothing. And uh, he, he'll be on the outside looking in. In the church that was weak, they didn't have any strength. 
and it was the one that, that you know, he held the door open. They kept his word. They were faithful to his name. And that, that just amazes me. So what, what church are we? What kind of Christian are, are you going to be? Many Christians, they don't, they don't want to let God, God break them. And, and I, a passage that come to my mind was Genesis 32, when Jacob wrestled with a man until the breaking. And I, I, I stop right there and just think it. I know what it says, until the breaking of the day. But he wrestled with a man until the breaking. God will wrestle with you and wrestle with you until the point where you got to get broken. <laughs> until you finally get, get broken. And God, God touched Jacob, if you know that story. He touched him when he was in his, in his strength, right? He touched the, the, the hollow of his thigh. And if your thigh is one of the biggest muscles in your body. That's like where your power, your drive, and all that stuff. He touched him in a in a big muscle, and he, he broke him down. He wrestled him down until the breaking of day. And so, look, we're in, we're in bad shape, bad shape until we get broken. How about that for a paradox? <laughs> Most people think, man, if you're broken and beat up, you're, in, you're not in good shape at all. But it's the opposite. You're not, you're not in good shape until you get broken. You know, people say, well, you know, I'm fit as can be. I could squat 400 pounds. I could bench press 300 pounds. I could deadlift 500 pounds. I could swim 10 miles. I could you know, run a marathon, uh, record time, I could dunk a basketball, just, you know, just look at me, look at all what I can do, and I was in reading Psalms, go to Psalm 47, one of my daily readings, a couple, uh, a couple, maybe a week ago, something, Psalm 47, verse number 10, and uh, like I said, this was one of those passages that, uh, right when the, you know, the Olympics started, I ended up reading this one, thinking, hmm, here's something, Psalm 147, verse number 10. He delighteth not in the strength of horses, of, of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. I mean, you know, the, the, you're, you're, you're in bad shape until you get broken. He, God don't take pleasure in the strength of, of, your, of your legs w without God. You know, people that don't give glory to God, it's a waste of time. So in other words, you got to get broken. They got to break in a horse. They got to break in a bowl. They got to you got to break their will. In other words, so you you're, you will get in a lot of trouble if you allow this the old Adamic nature, the nature that we get from Adam, our old man, to run your life. You get in a lot of trouble when that with that attitude of I can and just I am. That's not that's not the attitude. He'll be on the outside. Now I want to say this as a as a qualifying statement okay and you could say you could say amen to it i believe these are all true the son of god has never rebelled against the father never amen he never rebelled against the father the son of god was he never resisted the father's will he he, he cried out in pain he looked at that cup that he was going to get the cup of wrath about to be poured out on him he said father you know if it be possible let this cup pass for me nevertheless not my will but thine be done so there was never rebellion in the Son of God. There was never resistance for the Son of God to the God the Father. Never, ever. So I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. I, I see, a, I come back to Revelation, I see kind of a picture uh, that I've never really saw before. In, in, out of all the times I read Revelation, I see this picture. you got to give me some liberty because it might not be exactly correct, but give me some, some liberty to, to go with it. Revelation chapter 3, he says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I word thou were cold or hot, so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So I see God saying, I'm sick of the Laodicean church. I'm sick of them. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to spew them out. I'm ready to just throw them up. I picture God the Father up in heaven saying, that church makes me absolutely sick to my stomach, makes me disgusted. But then the son walked up to the door, and he's, he's knocking on the door. And, he, and, you know, he's like, there, like I said, there's never been evil tension between the son and the father. Never. But God, the father in heaven, that church makes me sick. I'm, I'm, fed, I'm tired. I want to puke just looking at the church of Laodicea. And Jesus says, I, I know. I understand. I know, father. But I paid for her. I, 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 I love her. She's mine. She's mine. I don't have a very good illustration for this, but did you ever see a father that did not like who his son was getting ready to marry? <laughs> Don't you marry this, don't marry this. But the son loved her. He loved her and wanted, and wanted to marry her. You know, that may not be the, uh, you know, the best illustration, but there's the father in heaven, I picture. I'm ready, to, I'm ready to throw up looking at her. 
And there's the son that says, I know, but she's mine. She's mine. She may, she may have put me out. She may have kicked me out of my own house, but I still love her. I still love her. And, you know, there, I look at that, Revelation 3.16. There may be a Revelation 3.16, but thank God there's a John 3.16. <laughs> For God so loved the world. You do a good study on 3.16s in the Bible, and they're kind of blow you away and stuff. That's, I think that's amazing. What a wild love story. <laughs> the Bible has it all. You know, she may have put me out, but I love her. She may, you know, I, I paid for her, I bought her, I, I died for her. That's what the Lord did. And I'm just amazed that he still wants in <laughs> at the end of it. I'm amazed at that. You know, I'm, I'm amazed that he, looking at us, you know, I know we may think, well, part of the Philadelphian church, we're like the Laodicean church a lot of times. I mean, it depends what kind of Christian you want to you want to be, but I'm amazed that looking at us, he still wants in. He still wants to have fellowship with us. Now, this reminds me of a story in the Bible, uh, Hosea and Gomer. How many of you are familiar with Hosea and Gomer? Anybody? <laughs> That's uh, good. Let's turn to it. Let's read it. Hosea and Gomer. All right, let's see. Hosea, chapter number one. Now, look, look at this. Look at this story. This is quite the story. Hosea chapter 1, look at verse number 2. Look how this starts out, all right? Page 1160, if you have a Dr. Ruckman reference Bible. Hosea chapter 1, verse number 2. Look what it says here. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. That's who wrote the book, right? Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, look at this. Look what he said to her, to, uh, to Hosea. A prophet of God, look what he said. Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed a great whoredom departing from their Lord. He just told a, a man of God, a prophet of God, go out and marry this whore right here. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> now don't, don't ever, don't, don't, come to hear, don't come to that passage for marriage advice. <laughs> go to the book of Ephesians if you want marriage advice or something like that. But look what he said there to Hosea. So he went, verse 3, and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, which conceived and bare him a son. So Gomer, this was, this was the, this, she was a whore. There's no other way to say it. Gomer, she wasn't worth having the, the very first time. She was a woman of whoredoms, already filthy, already defiled. And you know what you're supposed to be seeing there, which I believe? It's a picture of a sinner. It's a picture of me and you. That's what, that's what it is. You, you, me and you will not, we're, we're not worth having the first time. In our first birth, we're all born dead and trespasses. We weren't worth having the first time at all. And God said, go to her, love her, buy her, marry her. And that's what the father told the son to do. Go, he said, go after us. And that's what God, that's what he did. And we were defiled. We were vile. We were wretched. We were not attractive. And God still sent his son to come after us. And let me tell you something that, that you're not going to hear. Well, here's something practical that you can get. You want to know you're not going to hear this in mainstream news or mainstream media. Sin will, will make you unattractive. Sin will make you unattractive, period. And that's something, you, I mean, you've got to like really ingrain that into the, into the young, young generation. There, there's a certain beauty that is in holiness. There's a beauty in that. And it, there's a difference of modesty and holiness. Modesty, people can be modest. But whole, true holiness is, is from God. You can't fake that. You can't fake true holiness. It comes from the Lord himself. You don't got to be sleazy and slimy in, in these days. Even though there aren't many real ladies left in America, uh, you know, that you, you don't, you don't, nobody, nobody knows how to act anymore and things like Ladies don't know how to act. You don't, but you don't got to be like, like a harlot that you see in Hollywood. You don't got to be like that. And uh, you just get in God's word, get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, God will put a, a loveliness on you that only, only God can do. He'll put, he'll put a, a glow on you that comes from the God of glory. It don't come from a, a paint can, an aerosol can, and look at, my, look at my glow. It don't come from that. It has to come from God. That's true, true beauty, and, and he'll, he'll put that beauty on you. And men, us men, we're not supposed to be pretty, <laughs> period. <laughs> You're not supposed to be pretty, all right? It's, when it comes to a man, a man's character is what makes him attractive. That's, that's where it's all at. And, and you know, a, a woman's holiness is what is to make her attractive. So here's, here's Gomer. Gomer, she wasn't worth having the first time, but she really, 
wasn't worth having the second time. Come to Hosea chapter 3. She ran off. You could read chapter 2 for the, for the details. She ran off, showed her true nature, went after another man, was acting like a harlot, had other children. And when they were done with her, and this is, listen, this is, what, this is, what sin, this is when they were done with her, when sin was completely done with her, when society was done with her, when Satan himself was done with Gomer, she ended up on the auction block, getting ready to get sold for, you know, uh, as a, like a prostitute or, or a, I don't know, one of them sex traffic rings or something like that. But Hosea chapter 3, look at verse number 1. Then said, un, then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silver and for a homer of barley and a half a homer of barley. And I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Now, I picture Gomer. She's diseased. She's wretched. She's skeletal. You know, she's, she's beat up. She wasn't, wasn't worth having the first time that we read about her, much less the second time. And the Lord said, go to her again. Love her again. And it's like he bought, he bought her with everything that he had. I picture, I picture Hosea bringing everything that he got for this, for this one woman, and nobody else is even bidding for her. That don't make sense, you know. Uh, who's the highest bidder in the room? He just goes in and just gives, just brings everything he got. Fifteen pieces of silver, some homers of barley and stuff. And this, ha this is a great picture of God gave us everything he had. He gave us his lovely son, the lovely son of God, hanging on the cross when nobody else wanted us. And he, he, he really could have gotten us at a discount, but God gave the best he had for the worst that he had. And you know what that's called? That's called grace. That's all I wanted to sing that song. Grace, grace, God's grace. He gave the best that he had for the worst that he had. He gave his life for my life. He gave his righteousness for my sinfulness. He gave his obedience for my disobedience. He gave his holiness for my wickedness. He left his heaven to come down and get me out of my hell. That's what he did for all of us. And he gave the best he had for the worst he had. And, no, and I look at that and it's like, Nobody's even bidden against her, but he, brought, he bought her with everything. And I don't know, I was just thinking about Jesus, and I was thinking about that, that scene in Revelation chapter 3, that I see, I see Jesus not even, not even leaving the door, and his father saying, she makes me sick. What are you doing? She's making me sick. I'm, I'm ready to spew her out, and Jesus, he's not even, he's not leaving, but I paid for her. I, I bought her. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in a covenant with her. She's mine. And I'm, I'm, all I know is I'm glad that he'll, he'll have me back. <laughs> when you get backslidden, you get, you get lukewarm, you get, I'm glad that he'll still bring you back. He's still knocking at the door. And it's, it's, it's you know, it's like the prodigal, the prodigal son, that story, you know. He said, Father, I'm not, I'm not even worth to be called one of the hired servants. But his father never even heard him. He said that, he said that in his heart. The father never actually heard that. He just, the father ran up to him, hugged him, kissed him. You know, come and bring the best robe, you know, or kill the best fatted calf, and let's have a, a great, you know, a great feast. That amazes me. So to one church, okay, Church of Philadelphia, God, he'll be, he'll be strong, and he'll be sovereign, as, as a theological people like to say. And he, there's a door that no man can open, and there's a door that no man can shut. And in the very next church, Jesus says that it's in the hands of man. That amazes me. That amazes me. In, in one verse, nobody can do anything about what I'm about to do. God, he opens the door, no man can shut it. In the next church, it's all up to one man. The Bible says if any man open up the door. Ain't that, ain't that something? And I'm thinking, man, Lord, is this, a, is this a call to pastors? Is this a, if one man opens the door to this church, then you're going to come in? Is that, you know, is that, yeah, a big deal. Is it, you know, people say, oh, congregations are wicked. It's the preachers. You always got to put the blame on the, you know, the state of the country. Why is the country so wicked and evil and terrible and stuff? The, the, the churches. Well, why are the churches bad and terrible and wicked? Because of the pastors. 
that's that's why. I, I, I never really caught that either. If any man, it's all up to any man. It's, it just amazes me how God works. Just when I think that, man, I'm starting to learn about God, you know, then, then, then you know, the, the, the more I do learn about him, the more that I see his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are way up there, up in the heavens. My thoughts are way down here. I just feel like I'm just scratching the surface at times to get to get to knowing God, you know, and that's just just look at how God works in different pages of the Bible. It, it amazes me. You know, there's a lot of fighting and stuff like that in the theological world. And in, the, and in the preacher's world about how do men get saved? And, and how, you know, how, how, how do they get saved? How they don't get saved? And I like in Acts chapter 8, okay? It was, a, it was a soul winner's story. It had a lot of man involved in it. You had one, you had the Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah 53. How can I understand this except some man shall guide me? God sends him Philip. Philip expounds to him the scriptures, preaches to him Jesus. He gets saved. They get baptized. And, it, you know, he, brought, they, he joined him in a chariot and stuff like that, and he got saved. It was, all, it was all like a soul winner story, all right? And then you turn the very next page, Acts chapter 9, and you got, you know, God saved Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. It was a whole sovereign story. It was the sovereignty of God when you, when you think of it. And, you know, God said, I'm coming to save you. And Paul said, I'm coming to kill you. God said, no, no, nah, I'm coming to save you, actually. Paul was on his way to go, go kill God's people, knock them off his donkey and stuff. There was no soul winner that was needed. Ain't that something? He talked to him from the heavens, and uh, you know, the, the, the head fellow, the head guy that was trying to kill the church, God said, nope, I'm going to make you the head of the church, make you an, the, give you the core body of doctrines to, to that one man right there. Paul, he was, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That guy was consumed with the law, you know, the, the Ten Commandments, the statutes. He was consumed with it. And God said, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you just a, a good dose of grace and you're going to become a grace preacher. <laughs> you're not going to be preaching the law forever. You're going to be preaching the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul, that's what he was. For by grace are you saved. Grace, 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 grace to you, grace to you. He was a grace preacher. <laughs> he started out preaching the law, you know, and uh, that's why he was caught. Or that's why he was chosen. To, he made all of these Christians cry and bleed all over the country of Israel and God now called him to cry and bleed all across the country for his namesake for the sake of Jesus Christ so now look at it, that's why you can't get caught up too much with how things are carried out you know if, if you if you base your whole theology on Acts chapter 8 for a person for how sinners to get saved well you you need a you need a bible you got to get you have to have a soul winner you have to have somebody that's reading the Bible, somebody that's already interested in the Bible, reading the scriptures. How many of you, you know, ever had an Acts, out of all the witnessing you've been doing, do you ever have an Acts 8 con con uh, conversion? Where somebody, you walk up, somebody, they're reading the Bible, and you say, and they're, how did I get saved? And you, and you come down to them and say, man, this is exactly what I was waiting for. Let's go to Romans. Let's go here. You, that's, that's rare. That's very rare. I may have had that maybe the first time I got saved, and it wasn't even like that. I don't even know if he was interested. Well, he did. It was that kid's side. He said, I want to know more about Jesus. That was it. That was it after that because I was talking about him in class and stuff like that. But that was it. So you better not hang it all on Acts chapter 8, you know, because then you, you, you need all that stuff. Because then you go to Acts chapter 9, and here's a guy that didn't even want to get saved, and he got saved. So you got you to you have that balance, and God makes him the apostle of the Gentiles. How about this? I was thinking of another contrast with God. Romans chapter 9, God says this, He will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he will harden whom he hardeneth. That's a Calvinist favorite passage. You know, that's a, then you flip the page, Romans chapter 10, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. <laughs> it's like, you know, what, what, what's, what is it? It's theologians and stuff, they get hung up on this stuff. They try to get so much into the mind of God. And I'm just trying to show you this, that to the church, to the church, to the Christian, it says that I can't, okay, if you say that I can't, God, God will. And to the person that says, I will, God says, I can't. <laughs> it's that simple. It's, it's, that, that's, that's, the, that's the message. And, 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 and a Christian that, that has that heart that says, you know, I can't, but I, I, I really want to. I really want to serve you. He'll open that door. And whatever door he'll open, it'll be a, a, a door open from God that no man can shut it, no devil can shut it, no 
pagan in Hollywood or no pagan trans, transgender person in the Olympics. Nobody can shut this door. It'll be open from God. And only God can open it and God can close it. But if you puff your chest up and say, I'm going to run my life, well, he'll just be on the outside looking and knocking on the door. So I like that verse. It says, uh, if, look at that again. If any man, if any man hears my voice and opens the door, if any man, and I was reading about a, a, an old time preacher, Dr. Percy Ray. How many of you have ever heard of Percy Ray? Anybody in here? All right, Dr. Percy Ray. Uh, he, he started pastoring a church, Myrtle Baptist Church in 1935. And I read that he had some of these old time revival meetings, these old time uh, camp meetings. And it, one of them was called Camp Zion. It was in 1949. And from the sound of it, this was one of the greatest camp meetings that that uh, America ever had in modern times. You had 1948, Israel was, re was, you know, made to be a nation, 1948. In 1949, he started this camp meeting. And every preacher in America you would hear would go to this camp meeting and, you know, try to get filled with the Holy Spirit of God and things. And he said that one day he said that he's going to resign his church, that, that he's been at for 12 years. I'm, I'm stepping down. All, they, all we've been doing is fighting and fussing and fighting, you know, for 12 years. He, and he said he would, that day he was going to announce his resignment. I'm done. And uh, he, next thing you know, he announced it, and he, he walked out the doors. It was them old, you know, them, them old swinging doors. He walked out into the foyer. He's getting ready to go out. And, and the story says one lady ran out the swinging doors as they were still swinging. <laughs> she grabbed his arm and said, Preacher, would you just stay for, for one? Would you stay, would you stay for one? And now that's, that's, that's quite the thing. Would you just stay for one? And he said, you know, we, that, that, that stopped, God smote him in his heart. He, it stopped him dead in his tracks. And he went back in there. And, uh, and people didn't like it. <laughs> you keep reading and, uh, the rest of his story. that uh, uh, His biography was called um, A Ray of God by Percy, by Percy Ray. And they, he stayed. And then the next six weeks he voted out half the congregation and uh, thing you know they they'd have, they'd have these uh, they'd go out into the prayer field they would call it and they would open up an old Schofield King James Bible they were reading the King James Bible they would be reading scriptures praying all night long you hear these crazy stories shooting stars are coming down and like it was like just you know God was all around and you know next thing you know people from uh, you know they from that moment on that's when they started Camp Zion and I, you would hear from 48 states would all come to that meeting preachers everywhere. And from what I read, it every preacher around that time wasn't impacted directly or indirectly from that that big movement or that big revival meeting, and uh, at, at that time. And I think about this. That was an interesting time period. 1948, Israel declared to be a nation, and that, and you know, that, it's like that drawing power of God, maybe was turn is turning a little bit more towards the Jewish people. And uh, it's it's only if you think about that he's he's drawing Jews all around the world to go back to their land. It's, he's constantly he's constantly doing that, and and it's like the drawing power of the Gentiles is kind of fading away, you know. And that's 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 true. You could hardly get Christians in a Bible believing church, much less sinners in a in a Bible believing church. But it's like that drawing power of God is fading away. It's fading away quick, and you know God let one man. He's in, I think he was in, uh, in, in Mississippi that, that greatly affected preachers back in that day. And who knows if it, that, one wo that one woman wouldn't have grabbed him by the arm like that. One woman said, don't go, just stay for one. And he stayed. And we don't know how that, how that movement would have went out. But, um, you know, that, that, that amazes me. Back then, man, it was, you know, it was wild times. Spiritually, physically, you had World War I, you know, back in the 20s and stuff which we know the whole, you heard it before, it prepared the, the land for the Jewish people. And then World War II came. Hitler thought he was going to, he, he thought he was going to extinguish and, and kill off God's elect. He thought he was going to do that. And all that did was bring them back to their land. And he thought, I'm going to get rid of this race. This is God's chosen people. I'm going to exterminate them. A couple years later, they got a nation. It was to prepare that Jewish person to get back in the land. World War III comes up. It'll be to, it will be to prepare, their, uh, prepare the nation of Israel, them Jewish people, to receive their Messiah. Or, or you could say World, uh, World War III will be the Antichrist coming in, and then World War IV will be for, to prepare the Jews for the Messiah. But anyway, um, 
those doors, back to those doors, okay? The Lord, he's holding that one door open. He's holding one door open, okay? And you can't do anything about it because you can't, period. You can't. And you need to quit fighting when God's trying to break you down and humble you. You got to quit fighting. And that's the, that's the American church's problem is she ain't broke. And, it, you know, any way that you want to interpret broke, <laughs> she's not broke. Physically, she's not broke. Financially, she's not broke, you know, broken hearted over sin or anything. So I think that somebody's got to preach a message on let's get the right things broke and let's, you know, get some other things fixed up. Somebody got, got to preach a message on that. Call Dr. Peacock or something. He'll, he'll preach a good message on that. Just, just tell him your pastor gave you the, uh, the sermon topic idea. <laughs> but somebody got to preach a message. That let's get the right things broke and Get them other things fixed up. So these doors, all right? You got, the, you got the I can't versus the I am. Those two doors. And I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to close with just a, with a few doors in the Bible. And you can do a study on doors, and there's a lot of them. Uh, this, is, this, is, this was supposed to be my outline. It, it started, you know, I looked up doors, and you got Genesis chapter 4. Sin lieth at the door. You got the door of, you got the door of sin. What am I going to do? Sin's lying at the door. Am I going to open it up? Am I going to walk through? Am I going to entertain this? There's always a door between you and sin. Always. And it's up to you. You're going to, you know, are you going to yield to that, that temptation? Are you going to go to that, to that particular sin? There's always a door standing between you and sin. Well, who's the door? It's Jesus Christ. You're going to obey him or you're going to push Jesus Christ out the way and I'm going to walk through the door. So you got the... You got Genesis chapter 4, the door, the sin lieth at the door. Then you got the, the blood covered door in the book of Exodus, the Passover. And, and, and what did they do? They took that blood, they put it over the top of the doorpost, the door jams, and almost like a picture of a cross, you know, blood dripping down, cross, you know, blood on each side. They put that lamb's blood over top of their doors. And anytime, Jesus, anytime God saw that blood over top of all, you know, I believe a, a Jew could a Jew did that. I believe an Egyptian could have done that too. If an Egyptian would have would have listened and actually applied the blood to their door, so you got the the the, the door of your home, the the door of your you know where you abode. You know what, what's your what's your door like? You know, covered in the blood of Jesus, man. I, I number one, an ideal household is everybody saved. That's an ideal household. Everybody under that one roof is saved. You know, and, and you you got to apply the blood of Jesus Christ on, on, on your doors and things. And you see the door of the tabernacle. I, I don't know, but I could have done more studying on that. door of the tabernacle would have been maybe something like the doors of church. You know, we, are we going to shut are we going to shut the doors of church because the government tells us to shut them down? <laughs> they come up, with, you know, some crazy virus that's going to going to pop up and they're going to say you got to shut the door down. But, you know, you could keep, you know, the supermarkets open. You could keep all your essential businesses open. But you shut the door of the tabernacle. You shut the door of church. Are we going to listen to that? No. Not, and you can't listen to that. that. That shows you that government has control of the church. Well, what, what is that? We know government is supposed to have control of the, of the church. It's crazy. You got the door of the tabernacle. You got the, you got the door of laziness. <laughs> as a slothful man, you know, as a door t turns on its hinges. That door will never move. It's stuck there. It stays there. You open it, it swings this way, it swings that way. That's all it does. And, it, and God says, you see that door? That, there's like a door of laziness. All, all the slothful man wants to do, he lays in bed, he rolls over to one side, he rolls over to the other side. Rolls over to one side, rolls over to the other side. <laughs> and you don't want to do nothing. And then you expect, well, look at the situation here. I can't pay my bills. I'm, things are falling apart because people don't want to work. They don't want to do nothing. So what's that? That's the door of laziness. Door of laziness. And then you got to go on. You got the door into heaven, and this got me off into other subcategories of how many times has heaven's doors opened up? That's a good study within itself. How many times have the, has the windows of heaven opened up in the Bible? You know, that's that's a, that's a good one. The door into heaven. Jesus Christ says, "I am the door." Right. So in order, in order to get into heaven, you ain't sending a rocket ship up there. You ain't kicking the door down with the SWAT team. You're not doing. You got to get in through this this door. I believe there's a there's a there's a literal door to heaven. The the gates, you know, we sing about the pearly gates of uh, 
You got to have the key. Who has the key to get into heaven? Jesus Christ says, "I have the keys of, of death and hell and uh, things like that." And he, he you got that. That's you know, Doctor Ruckman always have a good illustration of you know the password to get into heaven. What's the password? How do I get to heaven? And you know, you stand up there and you say, "Well, I, you know, I made it here, Lord. I'm, I'm a good person. I've done charity work and this and that, and that's wrong. You know, depart from me, cursing and everlasting fire." And another person gets up, you know, what's, what's the password to get to heaven? You know, well, uh, you know, I'm, I go to church every single week. You know, I tithe 10% of my money. And I, uh, you know, was a volunteer here and I got baptized and I did this and I did that. That's not the password. The password to get to heaven is I've trusted solely on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to save my soul from hell. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to be up here, but I'm up here based on his merits, based on what he did for me. Well, come on in. Enter Enter ye into the joy of the Lord. So you got the door into heaven. I thought this was another one. Uh, rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. There's the door of the tomb. Uh, it talks about the doors of the sepulcher. Jesus Christ, you know, there was, there was that one door. That, that door could not keep Christ in. <laughs> that door was going to bust open, you know. They, it, it, and that's what happened. Angel came down. He's, sit, he's sitting on top of the stone just kind of mocking him, you know. We, had, we put this seal, we sealed it up. But the next thing you know, you roll, that, that stone rolled back of the door. The tomb was empty, the resurrection of Christ. Then you got Paul, talks about the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And it's like that door of faith was kept shut for a little while. You know, throughout these times, you know, in, in this, you know, the Gentile nations, everybody that wasn't a Jew, all the Gentiles had all these various religions and various ways of trying to find God and seek God. And it's like that, that door was kind of shut on them. And God said, you know, in times past, he, God winked at the ignorance of the Gentiles. He let some things kind of slide a little bit, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to repent. And Paul talks about the, the door of the Gentiles, that a, that, a, that a Gentile can get access to the true living God. The true living God. Not some dragon or not some totem pole or not some, you know, statue or you know whatever the romans all the jupiter and mars and all these roman pagan gods but a door was opened that only god could open for the gentiles to get saved and then another door in the bible was a door to preach the gospel a door to preach the gospel and paul talks about you know uh where this where this a great a great effectual door was opened unto me and how do we know the, the greater the door the more the adversaries that's what he said. The great door, effectual door was opened to me, and there were many adversaries. The greater the door, the, many, the more the adversaries. So that was supposed to be my outline, but it didn't go that route. Maybe, maybe next time we'll expound on those a little more. But I'm going to look at three doors, and we're going to be done. Okay, three doors that I didn't mention. Gen Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. This was like the, you know, the, this is like the beginning. All that was just intro. Don't worry, we're going we're, we're to spend too much time with them. Genesis chapter 7, look at verse number 4. Getting, getting really hot in here, I know. I'm going to, as a matter of fact, I'm going to crank that thing up to 3. Genesis chapter 7, verse number 4. You probably know what this door is going to be. It's going to be the door of Noah's Ark, Okay. Genesis 7, verse number 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. He talks about the beasts and all this. and uh, uh, Of every clean beast I shall make by sevens. He talks about the fowls, the birds of the air by sevens. Verse 4. Yet, for yet seven days. So he says, Come thou into, thy into the ark, right? I know all these, all these animals. Come, come into the ark. For yet seven days I will cause it to rain upon the earth, forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made I will destroy from off the face of the earth. Look at verse number 16. And they all went in, male and female, all flesh, as God had commanded them. And the Lord shut him in. The Lord shut that door. And I don't know, I maybe didn't pay much attention to this, but you know, Noah, it's like Noah told his family to go into the ark. Seven days, I'm going to give you a warning. You get in that boat, seven days, it's going to start to rain, and it's going to come down heavy, heavy. 
windows of heaven are going to open up, the fountains of the deep are going to break up and things. Well, you know, you could say the fountains of the deep are up on the top of the universe and stuff. I, I get that too. But you think about this. This door was too big for man to open. It was too big for man to shut. And that was God's plan. It, it, look, it, it had to be the drawing power of God to get all these animals into the ark. Do you think Noah and his family lassoed up all these animals and these elephants and herded them all up? No way in the world. It's a miracle that God drew these creatures into the ark. And what is that a picture of? That's a picture of drawing us creatures, preach the gospel to every creature in the earth, drawing us creatures, you know, men are likened unto dogs and bulls and wolves and serpents. What else is a man likened unto? It? Wild asses, colt, woman. Women are likened unto doves, deer, or a roe, um, a pig. So it's like, you know, God called. He's, it's the drawing power to get all these animals into the ark for safety and to get all you creatures into the body of Christ for safety. That's the whole picture of Noah's ark and stuff like that. But that was God's plan. So God, he opened up the door of salvation through Jesus Christ. No man can open that door, you know, he t and no man can shut that door. That's, that's the door that God opened. Now, that's beautiful typology. But there's one door, okay, one door in that boat. Man may have built that door. He may have built it in, in obedience to God, but it was God's plan. And man could not shut the door. Only the Lord can. And you imagine that? You know, God telling Noah, all right, look, you build this door. All right, made it, make it out of gopher wood. I don't know, biggest elephant, you got giraffes, they're probably up to 12 feet. I don't know, 12 feet maybe, 15 feet. Make this door 15 foot by 15 foot. This big door, set this thing down like a ramp on the ground. It could walk right up into it. It would be nice, you know, to get up there, up to the third story or whatever. Drop this ramp down, make this big, big door. And I picture Noah, okay, yeah, I'll make this door, no problem. You know, he builds this big door, big door. Made out of gopher wood, whatever kind of wood that is, I don't know. You, I don't, you could look it up, they don't really even know. Make this big door, and I could picture Noah, okay, Lord, we're going to put the pulleys on it now. We're going to strap this thing to an elephant, and we're going to tell these elephants to walk up, and these elephants are going to close the door for us. Because, look, <laughs> we ain't lifting this big, heavy door. We got about eight of us. This thing weighs about two ton. We can't even pull this door shut. And I remember when I did my barn door going into my bathroom. And I got these old reclaimed wood, you know, true two by fours. Made this thing about four foot, seven foot tall. Screwed them all together and stuff. I'm thinking, man, look at this thing. This thing's sweet. You know, got a nice, cool, reclaimed barn door. I go to lift this thing up. I'm like, uh-oh. <laughs> this thing got some weight to it. How in the world am I going to get this up my stairs? I remember, I, dummy, I got, I got a scale for some reason. I grabbed that door. I stepped on the scale. I wanted to see how much that door weighed. I busted the scale. <laughs> I broke my scale. But that door was so heavy. So heavy. And I picture that with Noah. You know, Lord, how am I going to shut this door? You know, we're going to build the pulleys. The Lord, that's not the blueprint. You think, well, Lord, this is crazy. We get these people coming in there into, my, into our ark. They're going to storm and kill us and stuff. The Lord said, you know, I, I picture what, like what he said in, in Revelation. I am he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. And, and there you go. Lord said, and Noah said, amen. I'll have to trust you like I did the rest of the 120 years building this, building this boat. More trust just to get that door shut, you know. We don't think about that often. So if Noah was in a church, I think he'd be in a church of Philadelphia. Small church, just consistent of his family, but they, they were obedient to God. So look, then I thought about another door. And we'll talk about Genesis, 9, Genesis 19. A couple, couple more, we'll be done. Genesis 19. You'll probably get an idea where we're going here now. Lot's door. Remember Lot's door? Genesis 19, 7. Genesis 19, 7. All right, uh, let me see where, where we can go back. Here we go verse number 6. And Lot went out to shut the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So he got, he got a bunch of, you know, so, this is in Sodomites. These are, the, these are a bunch of homosexuals. Two, two angels come into their house. And they say, we want to know these guys. And it's an intimate way. They, they, this is a, it's a perverted way. They don't want to sit down and have a conversation or a cup of coffee with them. This is a perverted way of knowing them. And he said, brethren, don't do, he called them brethren, that's bad. Do not so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you. And do ye as to them 
as is good in their eyes. And we read about in the rest of the Bible when you, get a, you give your daughter over to a wicked group of perverts, they rape her all night long and they leave her dead at the door. At the door. He's just giving his daughters over to die. After, you can read that in a book of you know, Judges or one of them books. Only unto, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of the roof. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this, this one fellow came in to sojourn and he, he needs to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than upon them? And they pressed, look at that, they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. What's that? That's societal pressure. Do we not, got, do we not got, get, got, get that? Do we not have that in this day and age, societal pressure, trying to bang our, our doors down to try to get in and, and believe like how the world does and live like how the world does? And that's, you know, teach our kids to be sex perverts at five and six. You know, they, they, pressed, they pressed for gay marriage and they got it. Okay, what, what, are, the, what are they going to be pressing for next? Pedophilia. You get the whole thing with the Olympics. They come out with, with polygamy. They're pressing for multiple people. Oh, let's, have, let's have five wives and stuff. And what is that? That's the, they're, they're trying to, they're pressing sore. And you've got to stand strong. They press sore upon the man, even Lot. Now look at this. And the men put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house. They're getting in. And look, and shut the door. They're breaking in this guy in Lot's house. The men, the angels, they pulled Lot into his house. And look what happens. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness. That's a physical repercussion for being queer. That's Romans 1. Their foolish hearts were darkened, so the angels, they, they smote them with blindness, physical blindness because of what was spiritually in their heart, both small and great. Ain't that weird, too? Both small and great. I mean, I don't know. You have a bunch of kids, a bunch of wicked teenagers, a bunch of men, you know, just a whole wicked city. Maybe some high, rich people, and then you got your, you know, the bums off the street. I don't know. Whatever way you want to take it. They, both, they smote both small and great so that they were wearied themselves to find the door. Ain't that something? He, he smote these guys with, with blindness. Now, how about that? Those angels closed the door on a pack of ravenous sodomites. It, that ain't no easy task. Imagine a gang of criminals come to your door. Are you going to be able to keep them out? Not with your AR-15 or your Glock. Yeah, I know, I know, I know some of you would be thinking, I'm going to keep them out. I got my AR. I'm ready to set up. Come on in. <laughs> this is before AR-15s and Glocks and stuff like that. You ain't keeping these people out, a, a gang of them. They're banging in, and you, I ain't going to be able to close that door. I don't think you would either. So, but look, they were no match for these angels, no match. They, they, struck, them with, with, with son, uh, they struck them with blindness, and, the, uh, so, and they, got, they, they left. So you got the door of, of Lot's door. So you got Noah's door. God had to shut it. You got Lot's door. God angels. The God's angels shut it. Okay, Come to Song of Solomon. This will be the last one. And we'll be done. Song of Solomon, chapter 5. And this is an interesting one. I was looking up all the cross-references of doors, and I came to this one and was like, hmm. Don't really know about this one, but it's interesting. Psalm five, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 5. Look at verse number 4. All right, Song of Solomon 5, 4, it says this. My beloved put forth his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. It's the general picture in the Song of Solomon is, yes, it's a physical love story, but there's, there's complete undertones of the bride and the bridegroom, you know, Christ and a picture of the church. So my beloved, this would be the bride speaking, put in his hand... By the hole of the door, and my bowels were removed for him. My insides were stirred up. I can't wait. You imagine if Jesus, if we knew Jesus Christ was just getting ready to come back from eternity, and I'm going to sound the trumpet in five minutes. I got my hand on the door. I'm about to open the door. I'm about to come back. You, you, you hopefully we get the butterflies and be like, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I got these mixed feelings, mixed emotions. I'm happy. I'm sad. I feel like a, a burden's on me. I got to go tell everybody in the in the world now and stuff and. 
you know, so think about that. And by, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to I rose up to open to my beloved. And my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet smelling myrrh, upon the handles of the lock. I don't know what's going on there. I opened I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn myself. Something got in the way between the bride and the groom, the wife and the husband there. Something got in the way. The only, the only thing that got in the way was verse 5, and I haven't yet to study that whole thing out. But verse 6, I've opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. My beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. That, to me, that's one of the saddest phrases in the Bible. And I don't know what it means. I don't know what it means. She, it, what, she took too long to get to the door or something. I don't know. You know, in, in this chapter, I, and I, know, you know, I don't know if this is speaking of Christ in the church in this picture, because if you're saved, you're a part of Jesus Christ. You, you can't seek him and not find him. And you, you, you know, he, he's inside of you and you're inside of him. You can always seek Christ. No matter how deep you, down you fall and, you know, you always could, you know, get your fellowship restored back to God. So I don't know uh, about that. But I know about this, though, is I'm glad that he's at the door in the church of Laodicea. That, that church made him sick to his stomach. And yet he's still at the door knocking. So, you know, all I need to know, all, I, all you need to know, all we need to know is that we just got to get a whole load of just I can't. That's the main gist of it all. I can't. And, and you could let him in the door and he can take over. And I think about what, what hour are we in right now? We're in the last hour. The last hour of the church age. And it's, it's the Bible calls it the, the, the night time. And it's almost done. The Lord's coming back soon. I look at this. The great harvest was from 1600 to 1900. The great harvest. And from 1900, I think from 1900 onward, he's been drawing the nation of Israel back. Okay, and the times of the Gentiles are about to come to a full, about to be done. He's going to go back to the nation of Israel. I think it is. Here's a last thing, church history real quick. 1500s, 1500s, the reformers, they stood up and it cost them their lives. It cost them their blood. They stood up against the Pope. They stood up against the false church. It cost them their blood. 1600s come along in the Puritans. They get some of the church doctrines cleaned up, actually. They get some things cleaned up, and, uh, and it, it got, they got them back to grace. We're not saved by works. We're, this, is, this is grace, grace, grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. Why are you telling me i got to take the sacraments and do this and do that? Puritans got the doctrine cleaned up in the 1600s. Then you got the 1700s, and back then they, you know, they liked what they read in the 1600s, and they were like, yeah, I'm going to preach this. I'm going to start preaching this. So you had true gospel preachers going around in the 1700s preaching Bible doctrine, right? Then you had in the 1800s, like to call this the time of the, of the pioneers, the missionaries. You got people like, like, what was his name? Livingston, he went over to Africa. You got, um, who's a couple other of them? Taylor, he went to China. Adonijah Judson, he went to India all around the 1800s. They preached doctrine. So I think of it like this. Doctrine. It was purified in the 1600s. It was preached in the 1700s. It was, it was preached around the world in the 1800s, in, in the 1900s also. And then you and I, we're in 2024, 2024. That's a long, a long time from the 1500s. <laughs> and, you know, and, uh, and we got in at the last hour. And I don't want to get too deep with this. I'm getting ready to close. But you don't find many records of genuine mass revivals. In, you know, after World War II, you have all these false revivals showing up, charismatic churches and tongue speaking revivals. And they were strong in the 60s and 70s. But we're at the end. And I'll make a, a it probably isn't right, but I'll make a, a little application with it. The first fruits, I look at it as the 1600s. The, the harvest, look at that from the, the 1700s to the 1800s. The, the gleanings, the last little bits, 1900s maybe onward till 2000s, maybe. I, and I looked up, I said, there got to be something else. What's after the gleanings? I looked up online, farming terms after the gleanings, and it was nothing. And the other thing, you know what, you know, well, you know what came after the gleanings? 
the clearing. <laughs> we're starting over. We're, we're, we're white. We're getting everything out. We're, we're tilling things up. So I was thinking this, you, you know, we're about, the field's about to get cleared. We're about to be gone. The field's, the field's going to be cleared. And, you know, you know what you got to do when the field is, is cleared? After, imagine, you know, we got a bunch of cornfields. You, know, you get the cornfields wiped down and road tilling it up or whatever, tilling it up. What do you, you got to do to find one corn cob after it's cleared? You got to get down on your hands and knees. You got to move, move some old brush pile back. You got to dig in the dirt, maybe a tractor, press the one little corn cob down in the dirt. You get down and you find a piece of corn cob and you hold up and say, I found one. <laughs> I found one. And what's that? What's the corn cob? That's a, that's, that's a lost soul that's still out there. Just one lost soul, you got to do some digging. Do, do some digging. And there may be one old, rotten, dirty, filthy corn cob <laughs> right below after the field's cleared. So we're, we're like... We're like past the harvest, man, you know. So anyways, you know, we're not in the 16, 17, 18, 1900s where 5,000 people would come, you know, Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, and then 1,000 people would get saved and dedicate their life to Christ. That's not going to happen in the last days. Perilous times shall come, you know, and falling away first and all that stuff. So, you know, but there's little handfuls of people. Just, just, that's why we pray, just one. I us lead one to the, to the Savior. So... To, to end, I, I just don't want to be a Christian that says, I am, and give you a whole list. I just want to be a, an I can't type of Christian, okay? I want to be the, the, the one that God let God open this door for me, and no man can shut this thing from God. So let's bow our heads. Let's, let's pray for a little while, and we'll, we'll be done. Now, <clears throat> uh we do see a lot what, what families are facing too. We do see, we look around us, the world is degrading so fast and I just thank God we don't have to be a part of it, right? So, Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you came by and you, you found me. Lord, I thank you that, that you understand each and every one of us, Lord, that you knew where we were in life and you knew, you knew what we needed, Lord, to be pulled out of the mud and into your marvelous light. I thank you, Lord, for the gospel of salvation. And Lord, please help us never to be a, an I am type of church, Lord. Please help us just to be an I can't type of church. And you said, like, like you said in, the, in one of the Gospels, you, for without me, you can do nothing. And I pray, Lord, that you open up doors for us that only you can. And I pray that you shut doors in our life that only you can. Lord, I pray that you shut the doors of sin and shut the doors of uh, sinners banging in on us and trying to take us over and... Just stand between them, Lord. We, we lean and trust in you for our protection. Lord, please keep us clean and strengthen us, Lord, to be good Christians in these, in these latter days that we're living in. And we thank you for your word. I pray we hide it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All righty, thank you all for coming out this evening. We'll do a... Uh,